Hey guys, I have James here again. Have any of you guys ever watched our video two years ago now? Oh, yeah. about a year and a bit now? When we talked about the long night from Game of Thrones and how clearly no one had ever done any sort of strategy gameplay or played any sort of board game at all. So now we're doing something a bit different. We're going to be talking about The Last of Us 2. This is something that you and I have wanted to do for the last little while, especially yeah. since we just, we finished it. This video is gonna have spoilers. We're gonna do a pretty big breakdown. We're gonna go through presentation. We're gonna go through gameplay. Then we're gonna go obviously into the narrative, which a lot of people are obviously talking about. We're just gonna give our two cents about the game. I think we have a lot of similar views and some things we might have a little bit of a different note about. It'll be a fun time. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna play devil's advocate on this one. <laughs> I got thoughts. So let's start with presentation. Um, I will say that this is by far one of the most beautiful looking games I've ever seen in, in terms of its photorealism, its uh, attention to detail in terms of the environments, but also, I, again, I'm not, I'm not a PlayStation 4 player, but the fact that the cinematics and the gameplay are the same engine. Like, S seamless. It, yeah, it's not a cut to black from the prettier looking thing to the now gameplay. It's all one, and that probably justifies the 150 gigabyte install for this game. Out of curiosity, did you play it on a, like, a regular PS4 or the PS4 Pro? Oh, uh, I played it on a PS4 Pro. Is there a difference? Uh, apparently, like, well, yeah, it's, it's stronger and probably louder, purrs, purrs like a hummingbird. Oh, the PS4 didn't sound like, I don't know. I didn't hear it. Oh, everyone was telling me that uh, on the Pro it sounds really, really loud, but... Oh, it's kind of like how it did for Red Dead. Like, yeah. I just played on a regular PS4, but I, I was impressed that this was a console game. Like, mm -hmm. honestly, this could be PC game graphics. Uh, I'll, I'll be curious to see if they ever port it to PC, but... Yeah, no, I thought it was an amazing, and some of the absolute insanity in terms of the level of detail in the environments, like... When you're coming into Seattle, you're passing through a forest that means nothing, essentially. But it goes on for about a minute, and it's just the whole time I'm thinking, this isn't gameplay related. This is literally for immersion's sake. And that frame rate, like, is Ooh, steady. Yeah, like, yeah, it, it's, it doesn't jump around dips. or anything. Yeah, that was... I was impressed the whole time, just looking at the characters, looking at uh, the environments, um whenever rain or any sort of blood. weather effects. Blood, yes, <laughs> just blood, the way blood. blood works in this game, I've, it's really impressive. The, the way it sprays or the way like it comes out of bodies and like little little puddles. And, and the animations too. The animations are phenomenal. Um, for instance, I admittedly, whenever I would come around a human and stealth kill them, I would try to turn the camera around as quickly as possible <laughs> to see their animations because they kept on saying stuff about like, oh, you're going to feel bad for killing people. And admittedly, they do have quite a bit of reactions in their face. They're not just like, I'm pretty sure down. <laughs> every NPC has a different name. Oh, that's what uh, some people said too. Um, and yeah, there are a few that you come across that are like, oh, Bill, Derek, rah, rah. and I remember that that was something that some people have commented on saying that, like, oh, it makes you feel bad for these people. And I I thought, I was like, has no one ever played the Spec Ops The Line? Because that's essentially what that kind of feel bad about what you're doing that aspect. That game did what this game was trying to do so much Exactly. Like, that's, yeah. what, that's what some people, I'm amazed that no one has brought that game up in terms of, like, once we go on to the narrative part, that's something that we'll definitely be talking about, that whole making you feel bad thing. I can't think of a single part where I, I ever had any issues with, with the graphics whatsoever. It was cool um, to walk through Seattle. Yeah, I, I could I could talk about just Seattle not nonstop on this one. When we were walking through it, I kind of made the comment. I was like, I wonder what... Uh... I wonder how close this is going to be realistic to the hall. And when you fell into the hall, it made it look like, right, it's not exactly like this, but eh, you know, whatever. It's not like the biggest thing. But the locations of the building where were where they're supposed to be. Yep. Uh, the music store you go into is an actual music store. Like, it's mm -hmm. not the same name, but again, that is, no. there is a music store there. And then, um, what, what does someone say? The, the Cheesecake Factory isn't on Pike Street, so <laughs> zero out of ten. <laughs> Everything about this was um, very, very impressive. Part that I thought that was so crazy, too, is the ending of the game, Santa Barbara, which is this ending that's tacked on to the ending. And you're only there for about three hours of gameplay, and that also, just visually cool. I wanted to stay there. I wanted more of that area. Actually, there's that initial part when you're going over the uh, the hill, 
uh, when you're still in, what is it, Montana or whatever? Where, I don't remember exactly where you start the game. Oh. And it's just, you're, you're going through like that, that golden grass field. And it's mm. at that moment, I was like, okay, when people are talking about the graphics of this game. Yeah, like, well, that's the beginning with Joel and Tommy are on the yeah, horses, like, right? Yeah, at the very, very beginning. Oh, um, so good. Just... And um, that's something that I'll say, I guess, right now, is for people who are review bombing the game, you guys can have your issues with the story all you want. <laughs> they you haven't ha played it. You, you, oh, yeah, <laughs> someone made that comment. There's like 200,000 user reviews for it on Metacritic, yet there's only 50,000 for Spider-Man. Yeah. So you know there's some review bombing happening. Um, but you can't give this game a zero just for the visuals alone. The visuals are, the, these artists put painstaking work into this game. The amount of attention to detail is absolutely phenomenal. You can't trash what they've done. These guys worked through horrible crunch hours. They worked their asses off to make this game as visually impressive as it has. And I think it sets a precedent too. I agree, one out of 10. It, <laughs> I guess I thought at first maybe Rockstar had set a little bit of a precedent with Red Dead Redemption 2's engine and just the visual style as well as the size, like, you know, it's a hundred and something odd with its in install, but that also game has online, which this game does not. Um, the fact that this is a 150 gigabyte single player game that people bought and has been successful that possibly gives me hope that they will put more attention to detail, more, they, they'll have more limitation, or more lack of limitations in terms of size and visual grandeur and just scope, I guess, for games in the future. So now we're gonna talk about the gameplay. Maybe we'll talk about the positive phone per, is the accessibility. This is something you've had in it, like, you mentioned something about Uncharted 4's lack of accessibility being an issue, and it seems that Last of Us 2 just took all of the notes that everyone's always had about that, and they made it, and then they took it and made a mountain of it. So, one of my biggest issues of the Uncharted series is, or really any Naughty Dog game, is the controls and the inputs are not the best. One of my biggest issues with console gaming is the controls and the inputs are never optimized, so just button mapping in this game made me happy that that doesn't even like they they've made it so you can be legally blind and one-handed and still beat this game everything from colorblind options to auto pickup yes. to to text to speech mm -hmm. like i have never seen this many accessibility options in oh in anything oh, pc it, console like anything it's amazing i'll admit like that's something that i've seen a lot of people do say as well as uh, people with visual impairments have been able to play this game um and I think the first thing I thought of was when you went through the difficulty options in custom, you could change how much damage you would get, how much the how good the enemies were, how much stealth was relying, yeah, how many or how many supplies drop. Yeah. Or, or, and at first yeah. I thought, okay, that's cool. And then I went to accessibility, and that's when like the whoa, I found like the whole treasure trove, like you said, auto pickup, text to speech, color optimization, color uh button mapping. Um, and I'm not a trophy hunter, but none of the trophies are attached to difficulty. No. So like, again, like that's an improvement from the first game too. Cause well, I, and all the online trophies in the first one too. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, I finished the first one on the original copy of it about a, a month or two ago. And I noticed that there was eight achievements for beat the game on normal, beat the game on normal plus, beat the game on hard, beat the game on hard plus. And I was like, what? what? And it seems that last of us two definitely, I think there's only one. It's just beat the game. Yep. I really hope that this amount of optimization is available in the future. Admittedly, there's a lot of coding that goes into this. There's a lot of back work for it. But I heard that you could... Um, it's becoming more of a regular thing. I've heard people say for Doom Eternal, they were able to map the controllers to make them basically a god. So for this, like, what, what, like, I guess if you had an example of buttons that you changed in terms of controls, what, what did you change? Um, I'm trying to think of like, a, like, I don't know, things like swapping your weapons just being mapped to like, uh, one of the bumpers was awkward sprint. Sprint was the big one. Holding oh. on a bumper to sprint when nothing was really mapped to the, the left joystick mm. click, like, Every other game has sprint yeah. on the joystick. Call of Duty set that like a long time ago, and that's yeah. kind of like everyone's is like click, 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 click. So it, like right? yeah, that that was that was the first thing. I was like, why why am I running with this? So the auto pickup, admittedly, I actually really did enjoy because something that it was really weird is when I went to pick up stuff and I was I was walking by, I was literally just tapping like I tapped a triangle, I guess like you're playing. Spamming it. Well, you're playing Diablo. 
And sometimes you would even miss it because if you've walked past it and the animation, like that's something, again, attention to detail. It's like Red Dead, essentially. You have to wait for them to actually physically grab it and put it into their pocket before you can pick up the next item. So if you've walked past it, it doesn't work. And the auto pickup is a lot more tentative than that. Like the instant, like you don't have to spam it. You can focus more on like just the immersion of it all. I, I would definitely say the accessibility is one of the best parts of this game, aside from the visual. That's that, that alone is a reason not to give this a zero. You can talk about the graphics, but the accessibility, like that mm -hmm. could change the console gaming landscape. Oh. The gaming landscape forever. Exactly. Like, that, that warrants it. We're going to have yeah. huge changes from this. This is going to be massive. However, I will say in terms of how the game plays, I thought, considering it's been seven years and I was able to be right fresh from playing the first one, I felt like at 1.5 in terms of anything changed. Very little was different from the first one. Very little variancy. For instance, the humans have one new enemy. Ah, uh, they had two enemies. There's, there's the dogs. They have the dogs and yeah. the big, big people. For the infected, technically there's only one new one, which is the shambler. Sure, there's the thing in the hospital, but... Really, there's one new variant, and I thought that, you know, for the, that amount of time that maybe there would have been a little bit more, like, sure, everything looks different, but in terms of how the game plays, it's very similar. I mean, the, the Seraphites were a cool addition. It's not really, a, like, a new type of enemy. They shoot you, but... Oh, the Shamblers? No, the, the, the Seraphites. The, the Scars. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, the... Yeah, the, yeah. That, that was a cool addition. Oh, that was... They, and they, they always knock you down when they shoot you. Like, that's... Oh, well, the arrows were like... Eh. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no. no they, but, there's, like, a few nips here and there that are a little different, but I just thought that... I I thought there would be a little bit more variancy. I thought there would be more enemy types. I thought that... Um, the only real improvement was the... Like, to me, was um, the shivs. Like, there's no breakable shivs. It's yeah. just... How, but well, I actually, well, for Abby, Abby, there, Abby does, but that was something also too, is in the first one, I liked it that you had to ration your shivs because you either could use a shiv to take down a clicker or you could use it to get into a, a safe or yeah. into a safe room, which kind of reminded me of Dead Space where you would have to hold on to nodes, whether to use them for yourself or to use them to get into areas where to get uh, stuff. And the fact that they took that out, I held on to Abby shifts for a while. So while we're talking about safes, and I want to go back to accessibility on this, because this is actually one of my favorite features of the game. I didn't need a single safe code on a piece of paper for the entire game. You can close your eyes and listen to the game for a click on the safe, and you can open every safe in the game with your ears. Whoa, I didn't know that. I, I noticed on the first safe, I was like going through with my headphones on and like I got into the, the actual number with my paper and I heard click. I was like, wait, can I, can I just do this on my own? Tried it for the rest of the game. I was like, even if I had the paper, I was like, I have to at least guess once to see if I can do this. Oh yeah, no, and how many times were you able to get it? Uh, I think there was only one time I screwed up on the first try, got on the second, but like it wasn't difficult. Like you just have to like- Really listen. Close your eyes and and just zone it. Whoa, it makes you feel like an actual safe Yeah, it, it just kind of taps into that uh, that immersion. I Probably my favorite addition to this game. That's yeah, actually yeah. pretty awesome. I did not know that. That's a, again, really awesome kind of variancy to, like, the immersion. I definitely will give this game points for that. Definitely for immersion. I felt that there would be a little bit more considering how much time it's been spent on development and also how long the game is, too. I thought there would be just a little more, especially considering there was no multiplayer. So all of the development was put into single player. I think that it just more so went into the narrative design. This is something else that we can talk about in terms of challenge or fun. Abby has the two best missions in the entire game, in my opinion. And that is the hospital and the sniper. The sniper was cool. The sniper was a bitch. Yeah. I, I first I thought, like, you know, when you're going through the streets, I was like, oh, this is, okay, this isn't that hard. And then all of a sudden he starts shooting at the cars, like, what's he doing? Oh. And then <laughs> the infected start coming down the road and you think you've got them and then another wave and another wave. I'm trying to think of, like, an Abby mission that, like, or not an Abby mission, an uh, Ellie, Ellie mission, mission that I really, really liked. It was cool to see uh, an open area at the beginning. Yeah. But they never really do Did that again. again. No, and uh, I, I guess... That's fine. I guess but... I can understand. I think it... 
um, I understand what they're trying to do. Like, okay, we can't make this an open world game, but maybe we can make one segment of it an open world game. Well, they did it with Uncharted 4, but they did it in the middle of the game. And I almost prefer that more rather than when it happened with Ellie, I was almost overwhelmed and like, I did everything. I got the achievement for exploring everything, but it was almost like, I want to move on with the story rather yeah, than go well, and explore a bunch of stuff. But that, that's just a personal preference. That's... Oh. It comes at, like, technically that is the opening of the game, because everything up until then I would technically call the tutorial, yeah. almost. Prologue-ish. Yeah, prologue. And I had kind of some fun with it, because again, kind of looking at Seattle, seeing how the, uh, just the city had been destroyed by war prior to, like, during the infection rise stage, and then just what everything happened. Like, for instance, I didn't realize, like, the, uh, the scars when their island, when they're like, oh, they're kept talking about an island, then I saw the Seattle Tower. Like, are they, it's like, wait, what the island? fuck? Island? <gasps> and that kind of made me like, it makes me want to know more about the world. And that's something I've always found kind of interesting about how there is so little narrative. Like, and there's no, as far as I know, there's one graphic novel. There's no novelization of anything about what happened to the world. Um, it seems like Druckmann's is like, it's just us we only touch what we want, except for that one graphic novel about Ellie. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was called, but it was essentially what the, the DLC for the first game was. Yeah. I never played the DLC for the first game, but... Me neither. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still think the game was kind of fun to play, and there's that argument that you are supposed to stretch, like, you know, you find something that's fun, 30 seconds of fun about your game, and you stretch it. Definitely stretch it. He also said that, you know, he didn't want the game to be fun. Yeah. Which... It was. Yeah. I, I get what he's trying to say, but it, it was still a fun game. Mm -hmm. Just... We were able to finish it, and that's like a massive... That's an example that it was fun, that it was enjoyable. Um, for instance, Two Worlds played that game for five minutes, took that shit back. I bought that day one. Same. Yeah. I got some friends who like coerced me into it, and then I bought it. I was like, you guys are assholes. Having grown up in Seattle or outside of Seattle, one of my, like, the coolest things of this game was there's a part when you're talking about going back with Tommy, and he says, we're going to pass through Enumclaw and then go through Fall City on our way back. Fall City is the town I grew up in, like, a very, very small town of a few thousand people. So, shout out to Fall City. Super cool. Thank you, Naughty Dog, for, uh, you're like, Ooh. I was like, do we get to go to Fall City? No, no I, I, I couldn't play it if I was going back there. It would be, <laughs> that'd be too much. <laughs> um... No, it's, like, again, they did a lot of really cool detail, and I found it funny that just with Seattle's history, well, I don't know if you saw talk about it right now, it seems a bit crazy, but the idea that Seattle's always been more of the, given the impression that it's one of the more peaceful cities in the, uh, in the United States, and it is now a complete and utter hellhole, I thought that was kind of a bit of a interesting irony, um, I, yeah, I, and what I was fascinated with is, um, I don't know why I know the statistic, but uh, out of the 50 states per capita, Washington has the highest number of atheists and they somehow got semi taken over in Seattle by a religious cult. I, that was something I wanted to know more about too, actually, was the, who the woman was. This, <sighs> see, it's funny that they spend so much time. You, you spend a lot of time in this game. You don't know a lot about certain things. Like, which is cool, I guess. Which, again, yeah, there's that ambiguity. Um, like, for instance, the guys who you come across at the very end of the game. What the hell were those fucking totems? Like, right. like they like they had a huge slave culture. I was like, well, I want to know more about these guys. We're going to just jump into the narrative then? Okay, so yeah. So now, <laughs> I mean, we're already right. talking about it. All right, it. so now we're going to talk about the narrative, <sighs> and uh, we'll just, we'll get the thing out of the way right off the bat. I guess I can understand why you're upset, because that's kind of what the game is trying to do. But I don't know why people are surprised that Joel dies, considering when they released a teaser two years before the game was released, everyone was kind of getting the rumors like, oh, Joel's dead, he's like a ghost, he's a spectral... He's in Navi's mind. Yeah, and I mean, out of all of the promotional stuff, the gameplay, the the initial trailer, uh, the box art, all Ellie. Yeah. All Ellie. Like, I went into this being like, yeah, Joel probably dies early on in this game. 
Yeah, I was expecting that. Um, the two things that are about the people have been complaining about the marketing, one, that Abby is completely absent from it. And considering she's such a massive aspect of the game, I think that maybe even the marketing team were like, yo, bro, we can't, we can't talk about her because there's was... no way we can't say anything about her without spoiling it. And if the very least people are going to be thrown off and we're not going to get as much of a reputation, so we can, we just have to focus on Ellie. Uh, another people were also upset that Joel is, was, uh, um, he wasn't rightfully shown in the trailers. Like, for instance, there's certain scenes where it's flashbacks, but they actually use the older model of him. Or there's another one where they have him saying a line that Jesse says in the game. And I didn't know that until someone huh. pointed that out. I was like, oh! So they pulled what Marvel did for the Endgame and Infinity War trailers? Y'all don't remember the massive amount of trailer stuff that they were... They made shit purely to fake people out and that's essentially what naughty dog did in a sense like not on the same level but i would say that they wanted to really keep their story ambiguous sure it's a bit odd when you do act like the jesse part that part for me was like eh, i don't know that's a little weird but the him being older and things i didn't that's, mind that i don't care um but no you have to do it that's a marketing strategy you have to kind of dissuade people especially when a game like this is entirely single player and a lot of people want to know like you don't want to spoil the story but you want to invest them in it you have to do some form of marketing so i don't know that didn't bother me i think joel dying didn't bother me what did kind of bother me was the pacing the pacing of this game really bothers me because it takes the wind out of your sails at least three times. The first time... I'm, I'm trying to think of the three times, and I, I have three times at the top, like, just right off the top of my head, but... What are your three? Um, well, probably when you first show up in Seattle, I was just overwhelmed and, like, kind of waiting for the story to keep going. Um, the second one is probably the obvious one, is the old switcheroo halfway through mm -hmm. the game, because you're basically at the end of the game at that point. You're like, you've played through everything. It's come to its climax with the battle between Ellie and Abby. It's like, oh, by the way, here's a character that you've always seen as the bad guy. You have no investment in, and you can play as her now. And I have faith that I would grow to like it, but for the first time ever, I was not wanting to play the game. Because I didn't you, have to. Because you realize you're like, oh, this isn't like just a short romp. This is going to be a long one. And then... The last one for me is probably uh, the first part of, we'll say, the epilogue when you go to your little uh, barn house. I was like, okay, this is fun. And then as it kind of kept going and going, I was like, oh, there's more games. This to game play. isn't over yet. And there was like another what, solid five hours of mm -hmm. gameplay. Yes. The ending on top of the ending on top of the ending. <sighs> Essentially, mine are the same. I would say um, the Seattle one didn't take me out, of, out as much as I wanted to, but just trying to get these fucking opening up the gates. It's like, God damn it. Just, <laughs> just let me through. Let me in. Need power for the gate. Need gas for the power. Yeah, need that was... Jerry like, can for the gas. Like, yeah, I, I didn't care much about that. But then, yeah, like right when the, when you switch over to Abby, within the first few minutes, I realized this is not a short romp. This is going to be as long, if not longer, than Ab in Ellie's. And Ellie, I, I took me longer to get to the part, like... Ellie's part is longer, I feel, than bit. Abby's. Also, I blam through Abby's in one day. And one thing I will say is, like, despite being drawn out of it, um, I think I like Abby's story more. Mm -hmm. I think I like the characters she interacts with more. I think I like the areas she goes to more. Uh, actually, that's one part of Ellie's story I did like, is the convention center when you first encounter the stalkers. That was cool. Yeah. But overall, Abby's chunk of the game just made me wish we had a Last of Us 2 that was just Abby, and then this big confrontation between the two of them could have been the ending of a trilogy or something. Well, that's what some people have said, is that either there's two different options that they could have done. One is they would have had the narrative be going back and forth kind of more consistently than just a one-time switch, which I felt like it maybe doesn't give you as much of the narrative impact of like showing Abby's perspective and it would be slightly a bit in annoying to go back and forth between the two. And I'd also kind of clued in that uh, the doctor 
that Joel killed was Abby's father. So if you clue in on that and you're playing back and forth, it kind of ruins the big reveal. Oh, yeah, well, I always, like, I knew that Abby had a, a reason as to why. Um, like, that was, like, there was going to be revenge. And that's something, again, that other people have talked about, too, is, like, the, their voice, their frustration is they don't understand why Joel has been killed. Joel essentially doomed the human race for his own personal wants and yeah you could say that maybe the human race isn't worth saving at this point I, I, I actually think he might have done good at the yeah. end of the first game because if the fireflies had the cure and they were the only one to have the cure oh that's not good well, they're, 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 they're not good guys either well but. that's kind of like yeah what Jer Jeremy John said the same thing too he said that maybe like if you have it they'll just militarize it like what's it when you find it we make it and when you find something good you militarize it and I feel that maybe that that's kind of what could have happened, but we are seeing when we see Abby's uh, intro with her as her with her with her father, we're finding that her father is trying to do the better thing. He's trying to do the thing, the good thing for humanity, and to have his life be snuffed out. Like it's not that Joel killed the the only means of like it's not that he took away Ellie. It's that he killed the only person who could have could have. Contra uh, made a cure who was Abby's father so her entire revenge subplot is completely reasonable she's wanting to avenge like you killed my father prepare to die I would almost argue that Abby is the actual good guy or protagonist that she is more justified in her thirst for revenge than Ellie, Ellie was is. yeah because and that's something I felt funny too was when Abby uh, I, I don't know if it was a combination of like the narrative pushing me that way, but also the me wanting the game to end, um, was when you confront Ellie as Abby. And I felt like, yeah, you know what? Fuck, I just want to fucking end this game. <laughs> like, look. And the fact that that fight was a bit difficult, too. Like, she's she's smart. Like, you can't just run at her. And the amount of times that I died as Abby, I was like, okay, you know, I've got my... Like, when she gets killed by Ellie, those are very satisfying deaths. Like, she doesn't just die. She really dies so i think that you know that was made that fight is made to be that brutal and those deaths are made to be that brutal to kind of justify people's feelings about wanting abby to die and then when you finally do beat ellie and she almost kills dina and then lev is like no this isn't the way <sighs> lev the saving grace of this this game's story oh levin um Yara? Yara, yeah. yes. The moment I actually think that uh, Abby's story clicked for me is when you're on the high rise and they're they're kind of introducing, well, reintroducing her fear of heights. Mm. And you get your first like taste of that Joel and Ellie relationship that yes. you missed so much from the first game between mm -hmm. them. And you see like they or, care about each other or, or even later on when she's like, you are my people, like actually watching her grow in a way that you never got to really watch Ellie grow throughout yeah. the entire game. Abby has the arc. Ellie kind of does, and I feel that her resolution at the end of, well, the first time the game ends, when she's at the farm, and I even felt exhausted too. Like when Tommy's coming by, he's like, ah, we found her. It's like, dude, I don't care, man. I, you know what? She got her, she got her, she got licked. And she's done. I thought the game was going to end there. And I was like, yeah. oh, cool. Like, where we're wrapping it up, Ellie learned her lesson. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're like, oh, no, no. Got it. Just keep going. Okay, what really bugged me about that. Oh, so at the start of the game, Ellie wants to go and get revenge. And uh, Joel's brother is, is saying, no, let's not. And then he says, okay, I'll go and do it. You oh, stay here. Oh, staggering, right? Yeah. Tommy goes. Ellie goes. Jesse goes. Who, by the way, I didn't care about Jesse. No, nobody cares about Jesse. <laughs> but Tommy is actually telling Ellie, like, no, don't do this. And then the negotiation he makes is, I'll go and do this for you. But I and won't tell you. And then at the end of the game, he comes back. He's like, no, we have to do this. Do you not love Joel? Like, screw off like yeah tommy went full dickwad at yeah the end. And 20 I hours ago you were in the other camp less than 20 hours ago you were we all agreed no let's not it's done yeah also i don't understand how he even survived because he got shot in the back of the head well he's he's missing an uh, eye he's missing an eyeball but i was like <laughs> how'd you live how yeah. who fixed you like it just feels like the most of my complaints are about the ending but it just feels like the game ended, and then 
Druckmann was like, wait, what if we ended it this way? And they're like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, sure, whatever you say, boss. And then they ended again, and he's like, wait, I have a better ending. <laughs> what if we ended this we way? Ended this way? It's like, but we already have this ending. Well, put it on top of that. It's I like, have this genius idea. What if, what if Abby would die, but Ellie saves her while trying to get revenge? Yeah, no. Cool. I understand the narrative purpose of it, but the fact that so much has happened and so much time has passed that we find out, like for instance, I thought what was really strange is that they showed the, the interaction between Ellie and Dina at the, like the dance right at the end. And I was like, why did you hold off on this for so long? So he, that's actually where I wish the game ended is the fight between Ellie and Joel. That's, that's the ending that I would have loved for a couple of reasons because that was the first trailer they showed for the game was that cutscene with the kiss yeah. minus the fight with Joel afterwards. But that fight with Joel afterwards really hits home like the last thing you ever said, this is why you want revenge. You wanted purpose. And they really yeah, hammer that she, purpose yeah, she thing. She says, like, I'm, I'm willing to try and learn to forgive you. I was like, okay, that you get that. And then, <laughs> and then, then the game goes again. And it's like, okay, we, we, we get the idea of forgiveness now. Um, no, the forgiveness was the very last cutscene. Oh, the last cutscene? Yeah, when she's playing the guitar, missing the fingers. Oh, and that's when, like, he's holding the coffee mug. Yeah. Oh, and that, that's why when you go to the house at the very beginning of the game, you can pick up the coffee mug, and I'm like, what the fuck is that? I mean, that's a this? throwback to the first game of Joel wanting coffee. Yeah. Which I, I was really hoping they'd bring that back, because that's honestly one of the most memorable lines to me of the first game, is like, I could really go for some coffee. What's that? <laughs> oh, so. Yeah. No, I, and I liked that too when I started the game again and I saw the mug, I was like, oh, this is that one, that's why this is coffee. A, that's why the significance of this cup. You think that the last interaction between the two is them having a fight, but then the, really the actual last interaction between the two is her saying that she's willing to forgive him. And I don't know which one of those hurts more, but I'm, I'm also a big fan of like, I think I might have even talked about this in our Game of Thrones talk, but I'm a big fan of um, a narrative starting with a problem or a situation and ending kind of on that same note. I just watched 1917 where, mm. you know, he starts by waking up underneath a tree and, and I, I called it like halfway through. I'm like, he, it's going to end with him falling asleep underneath the tree. Oh, and with the first trailer being that cutscene and me looking for it through the entire game and it ending with that cutscene with a little bit more that makes it hurt. I was like, oh, wow, good ending. Good ending, Naughty Dog. There's more. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, when you come into the final part and you fight, uh, you're forced to fight El, uh, Abby. And I thought that that was pretty impressive, like, in terms of how brutal they made that fight. But I also found it funny how Abby, who's been up on a fucking totem and lost all of her gains, and she, <laughs> she's like a frail fucking stick, and she just like, oh, cool, you lacerated me, literally, but I'm gonna get in this boat now. Bye. <laughs> I thought it was kind of just like when, when Abby tries, or sorry, Ellie tries to play the guitar, and we get it for the upteenth time that revenge can be bad when she can't finish the song because she doesn't have the two fingers. And then she just walks off into the field and it's like, that's it? It's like, are you fucking kidding me? So I have kind of like a theory on that, I guess, or an interpretation where they play that song three different times in the game, that same song. The first time is when Joel plays it for Ellie. Mm. And it's Joel being like, hey, if I were ever to lose you, like that would be the worst thing possible. The second time we get it is Ellie playing it to Dina, being like, hey, if I were to ever lose you, I, I would lose everything. Mm -hmm. And the last time, she has I lost Dina, everything. she has lost Joel, she has lost everything, and she can't play the song mm -hmm. even. And it's kind of her realizing like, okay, maybe it's time I walk off and try to get something back. In the way that Abby lost everything, but still had, had Lev. Mm -hmm. That's why Abby didn't want to fight. She was like, I have something. Let me leave with this. Yeah, exactly. And when you put the knife to the one thing she has, she's like, fine, All I'll right. fight you. Like, don't take things away from me. Yeah, there's a good, like, there is a good narrative in here. I think that it's just, it's got way too much fat on it, which is funny to say considering the first game has, I feel like it's perfect. In well, terms it's 15 of 15 hours versus 25. Yeah, right? yeah, like there's no fat, everything excessive has been trimmed. It's just a very, very well-focused narrative game. And this one, they, they wanted to really put, since they didn't have any multiplayer in it, they wanted to put more into the single player. And I can 
really appreciate that. I can appreciate the amount of really wanting to give you your every bang for your buck in terms of time and length and whatnot. Um, but if you're going to make a game that long, you need to have fun levels in it too. And we, like I said, like I felt the most fun I had was in the hospital. Because that part would freak me the fuck out. Yeah, when the game tried to be a horror game for the one time throughout the entire thing, I was... Oh, it was... It was like Naughty Dog giving me a horror game. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, like, you're walking in, and then my roommate was watching me play it, and when you hear the thing break out, and you look, and you're like, uh oh, oh. <laughs> it, like, it was giving me massive Resident Evil Dead Space vibes. Um, but then going back to the gameplay, though... What I thought was interesting, well, not interesting, what I thought was kind of a little bit disappointing was that you, you just shoot the thing. Like, at first, like, I fought it, and I was trying to run from it, and, like, try and play, like, really, like, <gasps> and then I just I was like, oh, wait, I got the flamethrower. Yeah. Well, the, the thing I keep saying with that fight is, if this was a shooter, this boss would be awesome, because the mechanic of a blob breaking off into pieces of more mm -hmm. uh, infected, and I, I was like... Once. Yeah, I was like, that's so cool, but I think they probably want to do it more and realize, like, hey, we're, we're, our controls, our combat is not our strong point. Like, this is not a shooter. This doesn't work that well. You'll be overwhelmed. Um, but in, like, a Doom or a Halo or something like that, that would be an amazing boss. Fight. Yeah, no, and I that's, too, there isn't really even a, well, yeah. You get one on each side. Ellie yeah. has the one in the arcade, which, by the way, is based off of an actual arcade. Which one was that? Uh, I want to say that's probably where GameWorks is located in Seattle, just uh, oh, a bit north yes. of Pike. Yeah. Yes. No. Um. Again, that's a great, another really great attention to detail. Oh. Uh, um. Yeah. I. I feel. But again, that... just emptied all the ammo I had, and it was done. Yeah. There was no. Like I think, it's hard for me not to compare this to The Last of Us One because this is not The Last of Us Two. This is The Last of Us Part, Part two. two. That was a conscious effort in a continuation of the story, and I think back to the, like, the gymnasium boss fight, and how, like, that was yes. just, like, empty as much ammo as you can, like, there was positioning that took, like, there were actual mechanics to that fight, and... Mm -hmm. Well, that's why, like, you know, weak spots, like, kind of placeholders, like, as, as ridiculous as Resident Evil 5 is to me, I always remember that game's boss fights, because I was like, you know what, these are really funny, you got, obviously gotta aim for the weak spots, you gotta aim for, like, you gotta... The boulder. Yeah, you gotta make... <laughs> <laughs> that okay. scene alone, three out of ten. <laughs> oh yes, we talked about it uh, at the beginning of the video. Spec Ops. Spec Ops is a game that makes you feel bad subconsciously. It's a massive game about cognitive dissonance, and there's three games that do it so well, and it's that, uh, Bioshock, and the first Last of Us, and this one kind of surprisingly dropped the ball. Yeah, I thought that was kind of weird that a lot of, like, so many people were like, oh, it makes you really feel bad. It's gonna make you feel all these emotions. And I was like, oh, okay, well, we'll see. I've done some fucked up shit. So let's see what we can do in these kind of games. And yeah, like, Spec Ops just kept coming up in the back of my mind. And at the very end of the game, they're like, do you feel like a hero? And I felt that that's what The Last of Us 2 was trying to do, is like, do you feel like a good person? Do you feel like what you're doing is justified? And that's Ellie's argument in a, in a nutshell. Throughout the entire game, I'm calling Ellie an idiot, and the game forces me to do it, whereas something like Bioshock, it forces you to do something, only in the end to be like, we forced you to do something. Mm -hmm. Whereas with like Ellie, there's that scene where you're with Jesse and... This is when I just completely dropped it. Like this. Oh, is, where she's like, oh, well, I'm gonna keep going like, after I'm, Abby, even though I we should be going. Like, we literally just, just agreed that no, revenge is done. And yeah, no, and that that was definitely. I think I didn't want to do that, and the game made me. And yeah. No, you, you, I was done with revenge at that point because yeah. the game told me I was done with revenge at that point, and there was no reason for me to seek revenge beyond that mm -hmm. point. I think that's the first big narrative draw. I think is that yeah, like that. I've been trying to fucking remember it this whole time, but yeah, that is essentially the first moment where it's like everyone starts to kind of be like, well, "This isn't Ellie. This is a really stupid character." <laughs> Uh, I I still think that Last of Us 2 is an achievement. It is definitely a visual achievement. It's a uh, accessible gaming controls. Um, it's gef definitely going to set a benchmark. Like now, games for the PS5. Like this is a proper, in terms of its look, in terms of its accessibility, in terms of 
how you can adjust the difficulty and all the other parameters of this game. This is a true next gen game from that perspective. And I wonder how much I'd rag on this game or how much I would praise it if this wasn't a sequel to The Last of Us. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to like detach that, but it's somehow the worst, most amazing game I've ever played. <laughs> because oh. like, I don't know, it feels like I'm eating this fantastic 14 course meal where every other dish is potatoes and room temperature milk with salt. And like, I think I'm done with the meal and they bring up dessert and it's just Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> Oh, that's, yeah, I, I, it overstays its welcome, which, and then a lot of people said, too, that, like, ooh, we didn't want this, we, we, there shouldn't have been a sequel in the first place. I kind of agree with And that. I do as well, but there was also a demand for it, and you can't say that you didn't want it if you, after I you, bought it. Yeah, we all, like, we were all interested in it, yeah. um, but that's, it goes back to just how the first game ended, that, am, that complete ambiguity in terms of its ending of, does Ellie accept the lie, or does she just say, you know, what doesn't matter? And then, actually, yeah, kind of going into the flashbacks. The flashbacks were some of my favorite parts of this game. The like, first time like, they gave you a flashback with Joel and Ellie, it was like almost a sigh of relief where yeah, it was like... spaceship. Okay, yeah, I was like, that's what this game is missing. The the characters connecting. Like, mm -hmm. it's not that I don't care, I don't care about Jesse, but it's not that I don't care about Ellie and Dina. I just... They've already developed together, mm -hmm. whereas the first one made me care, be there as yeah. that relationship developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're getting, you're not getting the proper development, the proper arcs that really draw you in. They're kind of relying on you to trust these new characters and be with these new characters. Um, even Ellie is essentially a new character now. Um, it's been only four years, but so much has happened, and we see that distrust between her and Joel because she realizes what Joel did. I will give one thing I really like, though, is that Joel doesn't say anything to her before she die before he dies. I was expecting him to say, like, a, ooh, but no, he's too fucking brain damaged. And I think that really helps illustrate that anger. That it, it envelops you in that rage. And... I felt that even though I knew it was coming and it wasn't as to me as I thought it would be, um, I, I it's a good motivation. It makes you want to continue. And yeah, it's a little bit weird and jarring to then all of a sudden switch to that character. I wish they almost dropped in more of the PTSD moments. Oh, that the part one was at the so end, good. Like, that was intense and that was cool. And I was like, oh, this is neat. And, say, and Abby has those too, essentially. She keeps on, you keep on going through that doorway, right? And I, I like that those are interactive. Those yeah. are interactive memories. Those are interactive nightmares. Um, I thought those were really cool because it's it's one thing to watch someone have a PTSD moment, but to act like in a cinematic or whatever, but to be a part of those cinem like those moments, those character mental issues, I thought that was another really cool um, immersion moment, if you would. Um, but then I guess the final final bit about this I would have to say is um, I guess people can have their opinions obviously people can have their negative thoughts like they you guys can either agree with our thoughts about it or you can disagree but I, I would definitely say let's let's not do the fucking Star Wars Last Jedi bullshit again in terms of just going after the actors and like you know what Druckmann's Druckmann's a little bit high in his own shit supply right now because he he's he started from the bottom and now he um, well, but, why go over uh, a Laura, voice actor, a yeah, mocap actor? Yeah, I like the fact that she's like she posted these death threats that she's been getting. It's like really, can we just agree? Don't do death threats. Yeah, just don't just be ever. Don't be a piece of shit. Like it's it's not her. She everyone in this is fantastic acting. Everyone does except Jesse. Yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, even Jesse's fine. He's just, good. Yeah. He doesn't get enough to really establish anything. Exactly. Admittedly. He, uh, but everyone is so like giving a lot of heart into this, and I'll give these actors this. Like, this is harder than trying to work on a George Lucas Star Wars Episode Three set where nothing's real because not even your clothes are real. You're in these funny little suits, and everyone's looking at you in this big white room, and you're holding this fake guitar. Um, 
the amount of emotion and intensity and dedication that everyone does. I find it so funny that Troy Baker is such a fantastic mocap artist because he's a horrible actor in real movies, but he's a, everyone in this is phenomenal. I thought that, mind you, I, I say that bit about Troy because I've only seen him in a few live movies and it, He's not given a good character movie then, maybe. Yeah. I didn't know he did actual acting, He's done acting. a few movies, and they're really bad. <laughs> and when I mentioned The Last Jedi, like, everyone gave the actress who plays Rose a bunch of bullshit and whatnot. It's like, you know what? It's not her script. It's just her playing the character, man. Like, what what are you going to get out of it? Ooh, you're, you're, you're insulting someone. You're, you're threatening someone's life for a think... fictional character? Yeah. I don't know. I feel that Last of Us 2 is it's definitely not this masterpiece that people are whoa, 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 about. But it's also not a bad game. No, it's it's, it's fantastic. Like, yeah, it's, like, w some people f call it flawed masterpiece. Um, I don't know if that's, that's kind of like a, a copy and paste sort of thing. I would say that it has excellence amongst its muddied, muddied, uh, yeah, when, when it is a masterpiece, it is a mm -hmm. masterpiece. I would agree that the parts that are masterpieces are, but the parts that aren't made me want to give up a couple of times. Yeah, no, there was a few times you were telling, like, we were constantly having <laughs> conversations via messenger. I was sleep deprived and getting ready for bed, and I didn't realize that there were still five more hours oh, of fuck. gameplay. Yeah, yeah, we, I was I like, oh, the, I thought I was going to wrap this up yeah, and go to bed. Immediately, he started the game before I did, but I had to rent it, so I, I had to blast to it, so I surpassed him. And then when he was where he was, and I was like, okay, so I know what he's going to come into. And so when he was in the hospital, I was like, oh, this is great. And then I was waiting for him. I didn't want to spoil anything, so I was waiting for him to get to Santa Barbara. And I was like, hey, did you like that ending on top of the ending on top of the ending? So, but anyways, I, I think that it's definitely a game that's going to be talked about for a really long time. I think it's going to, hopefully, the good parts of this game will be carried over into further developments, into further games... Um, I kind of hope that maybe Druckmann gets a little bit of uh, perspective from this because if he continues to, I don't know, I think this game really needed Amy, or Amy Herning. Oh, okay. She's the one who wrote the first one, right? No, no, um, Cormac McCarthy wrote the first one, I believe. No. Uh, oh no, that was just the road. The game yeah. was blatantly based on. <laughs> Whereas this one, they read the cliff notes on uh... the road. It's like we're trying to make it really sad. There's so much dedication. There's so much uh, being put into a single player game. Considering just there's still that blatant bullshit that EA said a few years ago about ooh, there's no money. Or what's it? There's no good no single yeah. Players? There's no money in single player games. Or and, I don't even know if they phrase it that way, but like yeah. yeah. And then Last of Us and God of War come out and like. <laughs> Go play God of War. Yeah, very good. <laughs> it's cheaper. It's better. Do you want to do numbers or do you not care? Uh, I mean, I already said one out of ten. So <laughs> I think I said I gave it like a five out of seven because there's so much and that you can't like the two are the pacing. The two detractors are the pacing and the lack of gameplay variation. Um, but I, I there's so much amazing like he said in this game that it has a lot of muddy muddy patches here and there but i still say that it's yeah it's not a bad game i mean just maybe it doesn't have a great story when i was getting to the ending and it was dragging on i really wanted to hit it with a three out of seven but when i finally finished it and i looked back and i i saw what i went through in the actual game itself it's it's a five out of seven like it's it's better than good enough yeah, it's 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 a great game, but and then also like too when you can replay this game through with the just all of the different things you can do, all the different accessibilities, all the changes. I really, really hope that that passes over into new games. Take on me. Oh, that too. <laughs> The, the guitar thing. That's... Anytime it let me play guitar for myself, I was like looking up tabs and stuff for all. Oh. oh yeah, no, it's funny how people have been doing all these videos, like showing all these covers, and then there's me who try to follow one. The ding 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 ding
Well, anyways, guys, that's our talk. I hope you enjoyed it. This was really fun, James. I've been looking forward to doing this for quite some time. Um, now we just have to wait another, what, like eight years for Last of Us 3? Is there well, even going to be one? No, they're saying the exact same thing they said after Last of Us 1. We'll, we'll think about it. We don't really... It doesn't need a third one. We don't know how we would do a third one. So probably seven years. So maybe, yeah. I, I kind of I, wonder if they bring Abby back. I, part of me thinks that they're just going to drop her, not just because of the controversy, but also because Abby's story is done. Well, let, let's wrap up on this note then. If you were to make a sequel, if you were in charge of the sequel, what would you want the story to be? I can't even... Because I think it would be cool to see Ellie encounter Abby again when she goes and looks for the fireflies and finds out that Abby's now a firefly, and they have to team up, or you have to team up with Lev or something as Ellie. I think that would be cool to... I can. I have like little uh, ideas that Abby would come or Ellie would come back to the sanctuary or what was even the town that was at the beginning? Like I keep forgetting I the name of it. I don't remember what it's, it's called. Just Tommy Town. Um, I think that she'd come back there and it's been destroyed. It might have like everyone's gone and she has to try and find Dina. Um, and then yeah, she maybe interacts with El with Abby and then oh maybe it would be the full circle that she would. They found someone else who could be a little bit kind of, uh, like, that might not work as much, but she would, given the choice herself, whether she would want to do the surgery. Um, because as far as they know, like, she is the only one who's immune. Um, that was something that was very absent in this game. Um, Dina gets told about it, and she kind of just, like, she's like, oh, they bring it up kind of at the end again when they're like, she's bit. Oh, yeah, which, which she uses that to her advantage, right? Yeah. Um, but I thought that was kind of... Like, obviously, that was the big, big part of the first game, and they didn't want to, like, copy and paste it again. But the fact that people moved on from it so quickly, like, Dina moved on from it so quickly, um, and it's never brought up again, aside from when she uses the clicker to, as a means to get her one on... I have kept calling him Dog the Bounty Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Uh, I feel that that should be something that's brought up in the third game. Like, her immunity is something that is at, like, at a trigger point now. Because I feel if we, there was a part three, this would be the point where the Earth is literally, like, this is humanity's last opportunity. They're in the final generation. Like, there's... I actually almost want to say something about Girl with All the Gifts. You've, have you ever seen the film or read the book? I've seen the film. I didn't even know oh, there was a book. But. Oh, but it's based off of a book, which, funny enough, the book came out at the exact same time as Last of Us did. Huh. And I kind of was like, did you... And I kind of wondered who copied who. Um, but at the end of the, la of the oh, Girl with All the Gifts, the creatures, the infection, the parasites, they've all started to form into these clusters of trees, and they're in those embryos, right? Those, yeah, yeah. those clusterizations that if they catch fire or if they're damaged, the spores will release. And I feel that that's what should happen. You should have some sort of cataclysmic moment that's... Like, the Earth is about to go through its second fucking and it's going to be the last one if they don't do something about it. And I think that should be... You'd have to really play it careful because you don't want to copy the girl with all the gifts but at the same time you... It'd be cool. I think that would be an interesting aspect. And again, it adds more variancy to the entire idea of the infection, which I've always found very, very cool. One of the coolest, um, if not the coolest, post-apocalyptic or, or zombie universe. I think I, I love the idea of uh, using the cordyceps virus as as a post-apocalyptic system. Yeah. Like... Oh, yeah, you can do it a lot better. That was really good. Thanks. <laughs> Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Bye was, for real this time. Yes, bye for real this time. It was very enjoyable to talk about this with you, James, and uh, I hope you guys stuck around. Uh, yeah, well, if you guys ever want us to talk about something else in the future, you know, we're uh, down for this. I'd like, like to do this more than maybe once a year. Uh, go check out our Pokemon Go review. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one guy who thought that wasn't fun. And I was in 100 Mile. I was bored out of my mind, and I still thought that game wasn't fun enough. You can just walk around in 100 Mile if you want. It is just something you can do regardless. Right, there was only one street. We need an excuse to walk around, okay? Yes, you do. All right, guys, that's it. Bye. See you later.